Hello to chapter 68 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from 8 or 10 to 12 and 15 inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact, these are no arguments against such a presumption because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber. And the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True. From the unmarred dead body of the whale you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin transparent substance somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of icing glass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits which I use for marks in... My whale books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say, but what I'm driving at here is this. That same infinitely thin icing glass substance which I admit invests the entire body of the whale is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of 100 barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity or rather weight, that oil in its expressed state is only three-fourths and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integuments yield such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons of the net weight of only three quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks and thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the icing glass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to be quick, observant, I, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphic hieroglyphical. That is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. 
by my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back and more especially his flanks effaced in great part of the regular, regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches altogether of an irregular random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the sea coast, which Agassiz imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces, like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant. For the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers. In all seas, times and tides, what would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout? True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn fire. Whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, frees his blood, and he dies. How wonderful is it then, except after explanation, that this great monster to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those at Arctic waters. Where when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterwards, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality and the rare virtue of thick walls and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. O oh man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou too remain warm among ice. Do thou too live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the, at the equator. Keep thy, thy blood fluid at the pole, like the great dome of St. Peter's and like the great whale retain. O oh man, in all seasons a temperature of thine own. But how easy and how hopeless to teach these fine things of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's, of creatures, how few vast as the whale. So that was chapter 68. Bye-bye. Till next time with ch chapter 69, titled The Funeral.